Hello, welcome to the Sarvi Wildlife Care Center. We have been in operation at this location since 1981. And in fact, that means that next year will be our 40th anniversary. Now over here, we have our housing for our non-releasable educational birds. Those are birds that are unfortunately cannot be released back into the wild due to some sort of injury. So they have to live with us for the rest of their life. And those are the birds that we take out to educational programs. Chances are you probably saw them at last year's Anthem Northwest during our presentations or at our booth. Now over here is our administrative offices, our employee lounge, and our intern housing. And over here is our brand new Eagle aviary, still under construction. It is approximately 100 feet long, and we are going to use this aviary to house large birds of prey, not just eagles, but all large birds of prey outside, so we can better condition them to the elements and also be able to determine if they're good hunters, good flyers, and you know, give them good exercise. We are looking to complete this early next year, and uh, hopefully we'll have our patients, first patients in it soon. My name is Elise. I'm the Raptor Program Coordinator here at Sarvi Wildlife Care Center. We are sorry we couldn't be there this year to celebrate with you guys, but we wanted to introduce you to a couple of our birds of prey that are part of our education program or our non-releasable raptors. Now, all of these birds have come to us over the last 30 years with a number of issues that have prevented them from being released. So this year is Chiton, and she is our red-tailed hawk. Now, she came to us in 1995 and she was actually found alongside the road. We suspect she was hit by a car. She came to us with a broken wing and unfortunately we couldn't save that wing. So it was actually amputated. So she's actually missing her right wing. You can see there she has her left wing, but she's missing that right wing. And because of that, she couldn't be released back out into the wild. Obviously she lacks that ability to fly. So she's had a permanent home with us since 1995. And she's a wonderful ambassador for her species because this species is one of the most common birds you'll see around Washington and actually most of North America. So the red-tailed hawk is a very common bird. You'll often see them when you're driving alongside the freeways or highways, even in residential neighborhoods, they'll be sitting alongside um, streets or on fence posts or even lamp posts um, looking for their next meal because these guys are uh, hunters of rodents. So they are going to be going after all the rodents, including rats, mice, even small mammals. They'll actually go after pretty much anything they can find. So we consider them generalists. Now, these guys have incredible eyesight. So you can see she's got really good eyes um, and she is able to see a mouse from a mile away. So she's got some incredible skills when it comes to hunting that allows these guys to sit and wait for their next meal to come along. So she'll be sitting alongside the fence and she'll be keeping an eye out for a rustle or a small mouse uh, in the field or alongside the road for her next meal. Now, unfortunately, because they do hunt alongside roads, they are often hit by cars, which was what happened in Chaton's case. So we do often see raptors that come into our center that have been hit by cars because they are hunting alongside the roadway. She's just adjusting. So we often see these guys come into our center with broken wings, potentially broken um, in a toes oftentimes as well. So one of the ways you guys can help birds like Chaton here and the red tail hawks that we see is actually to pick up trash alongside roadways and use less pesticides or rodenticide. So we often see poisoning as well in a number of hawk species that come into our center. So those are great ways that you guys can help reduce the number of red tails that are hit by cars, um, as well as reduce the number of birds that are poisoned by inadvertently eating rats that are poisoned. So we're gonna introduce you to our next bird. We are going to pan over to our turkey vulture. All right, so my name is Alistair. I am a volunteer here at Survey Wildlife. I've been here for about four years. And this is Aura. And Aura is our turkey vulture. She has been here uh, since about 2011. And Aura has a pretty unique story. So turkey vultures come to Washington State. They're migratory. They don't hang around all season long like Chitong would. So 
What happened to Aura is she was found over here uh, sometime during the summer around July and we found out that she had a feather follicle infection. So she, uh, we treated that infection, but her feather follicles are permanently damaged. So she has some flight feathers that you can see she's missing several layers and she's got some feathers that are kind of twisted and mangled. And so she is able to fly very short distances, kind of low flights, but she can't do what turkey vultures need to do. And is, that is, they migrate thousands of miles. So they go down to California, even as far as South America, parts of South America like Argentina. So Aura has been with us this entire time and she actually has a really large, beautiful enclosure that she loves and uh, we provide enrichment and things to stimulate her, bring her out and go to schools and to festivals just to, to so schools and festivals just to uh, educate people about these beautiful birds because they have, a, there's a big misconception that, um, that turkey vultures are gross because they are vultures and vultures are scavengers. And so not only do they migrate thousands of miles, but they uh, have a very keen sense of smell that they utilize to find dead food. And there's been a lot of misconception about that, which has actually made a uh, environmental impact and a large impact on the lives of these birds. So turkey vultures have... Oh. Do you want to go under the cover? We're shooting in the rain. I'm getting distracted with okay. freedom. That's there we cool. go. Hi. Say hi. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Very curious. My name is Robert, and uh, I am also a volunteer here at SRV Wildlife, and I have been volunteering here for about 19 years now. And well, who I have with me right now is Freedom. She is a North American bald eagle. Now, they are not called bald eagles because they have no feathers on their head. I'm bald, as you can see, and she obviously has feathers. No, they are actually called bald eagles because of an old English word that means shiny or white-headed. So these guys are the shiny slash white-headed eagles. Now these guys are part of the sea or fish eagle family. So you usually will find them near bodies of water, lakes, rivers. And of course they like to eat fish, but they will actually eat just about anything they can find really if they're hungry enough. Now these guys build absolutely massive nests. No doubt some of you have probably seen some of the nest cams that are online that have become really popular in recent years. And the reason for that is, yes, these guys are large birds, but they will actually continue to put more material on their nest each year. They'll reuse that nest, put more stuff on it, kind of like they're remodeling or expanding it. And they get so massive that sometimes they get uh, so big that either the nest falls apart or the entire tree will actually come falling down. But sometimes they just build it in a really good strong tree and they get absolutely huge. Now these guys have approximately a six foot wingspan and Freedom here weighs about 10 and a half to 11 pounds. That is actually smaller than average for a female bald eagle here in Washington state. They will usually get more closer to the 11 to 12 pound range. Now Freedom, she came to us at the Wildlife Center in 1998. When she was approximately three months old, she fell out of her nest. Now, believe it or not, when eagles are three months old, they're actually fully grown. They're their full physical size. They of course don't have their white head or tail yet. They actually don't get those white feathers until they're between four to six years old. But when they're that age, they're not quite ready to fly. So something happened, maybe she was a little bit too adventurous or she tried to go to a branch that's too far away or maybe there was a gust of wind. Either way, she fell out of her nest. She was found in Edmonds and she had broken both of her wings. She was also severely emaciated. And what that means is she had not been eating for a long time. She was really, really thin. 
So we found her, we were able to fix her right wing, but unfortunately her left wing was not fixable and it's actually frozen in place. You can see that she kind of holds it a little bit weird. So unfortunately she does have to be with us in uh, captivity for the rest of her life. And, in ca and uh, bald eagles in captivity can actually live upwards of 50 to 60 years or more. So she's got a good long life ahead of her. And uh, yeah, that's Freedom, our bald eagle. And hopefully her brothers and sisters will be in this aviary when it's completed to be released back after the wild. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. We hope we're able to join you next year or in future years to meet some of these birds up in person. And we want Yay, Jesse to the rescue. You got that one? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna take off her shirt or her sweatshirt. Yep. Thanks for calling and staying with oh, them. No problem. Or I want to use the lady I talked to on the phone? No, but Jesse's <laughs> the clinic manager. Cool. You, are, you guys are rock stars. Thank oh, you so much. You guys are. We're going to get him back to the hospital, take can some x rays. Can I get a picture? <laughs> oh, no, you don't have to. Perfect. Oh, dude, so cool. Can you guys send us this on our Facebook or um, to our, our um So we just got in this sharp shinned hawk. Apparently it hit a window and kind of broke the glass a little. It hit so hard. Uh, this is a common injury with these occipiters. These types of birds like sharp shinned hawks, cooper's hawks, goshawks, they all eat songbirds. And so when they're flying for these songbirds, they think that they can go through the window pane. They don't realize that it's a solid surface. So we see a lot of head trauma. We see a lot of coracoid or, or wishbone fractures. Um, so we're gonna just do an exam here. I like to start from the head and work my way down. So both the eyes are normal. The pupils are the same size. It's really hard to see their ears, but we wanna make sure that there's no bleeding. If we see bruising inside the ears, that's a sign of a concussion. The ears are very, very tiny. <laughs> okay, so the beak is intact, that's good. The nares, or what we would call the nostrils, are normal, there's no blood. He's a, got a little bit of blood coming from his glottis, so coming from his airway. So that would indicate that he had some blunt force trauma to his body, so he might be bleeding internally or bleeding from his lungs. Now I'm checking his coracoid for any fractures. Okay, I'm gonna take both of his wings. Now I'm gonna feel his shoulders manipulate them around, feeling for any type of crunching, any type of fractures, any type of swelling, go down his humerus, up his radius and ulna, to his wrist, out to his metacarpals, everything looks fine. Go down to his tail, looks good. Okay, go ahead and let's cover him back up. Okay, head down, okay. So now I'm going 
to look at his left leg. Did you notice, was he standing? He was standing, yes. Okay, and you can see his toes and his feet are perfectly adapted for hunting songbirds. Very long, very thin. They have very long tails, very short wings, and everything looks good. Let me just look at this one, okay. No fractures down the femur. There you go. Now I'm just gonna look at their vent or it's their cloaca. I'm gonna make sure that there's nice tone there. There's no blood. It looks good. So hopefully this is a little bit of internal bleeding which can resolve in a couple days, fingers crossed. We're gonna treat him with some anti-parasite meds and some anti-inflammatories to reduce any swelling. We're gonna give him some vitamin B to help with the stress um, and we'll get him some yummy food. So go ahead and let's put him away and then we'll get all of our meds together. We'll get some subcutaneous fluids ready for him. Um, yeah. And Hold on, wait. Okay, go ahead. Now that we have everything ready, um, his fluids and his medicine, we're gonna take him back out again. We have to remember that stress is the number one killer of wildlife. Telling them how much we're seeing them. Cause just holding them alone is enough sometimes to push them over the edge. Um, and they can't handle it and they die. They're in shock right now. Um, and if you were in the mouth of a predator, like an alligator or a lion or something like that, um, it would be incredibly stressful. So we have to try to put our, our minds and our, our hearts in how these guys are feeling. So I just sprayed him down with an anti-parasite med because all wild animals do have parasites. While it's normal, we do like to try to keep it under control while they're here. Now I'm going to protect his tail by putting on a little tail wrap. Because if he breaks his tail in captivity, we would have to wait for it to grow back. And the longer you keep an animal in captivity, the more likely they won't make it uh, because it's just so stressful. So we want to make sure that we protect this tail so it doesn't break because he really, really needs this. You can bring his legs down while you're holding him up so that I can give him some subcutaneous fluids. We're giving him a lactated ringer solution. So think of it kind of like Gatorade. It's got lots of good stuff in there that's gonna make him feel better. Go ahead and pull his legs down a little bit more. There we go. I gotta get into this little space here in his leg pit here. That's where we're gonna do it. And again, we're trying to be as quick and as efficient as possible so we're not holding on to him for too long because this is all incredibly stressful. It's like being picked up by a bunch of aliens. <sighs> And I can tell this is a juvenile because his eyes are yellow. When they become adults, their eyes turn blood red, bright, bright red. And I'll just a little bit of food. Can you put him back up against you? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna pass this tube down his throat, past his crop. Can you help me get past his crop and into his tummy? Just a little extra fluid. Mm, maybe too much. Oh, you gonna spit up? That's no, okay. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Okay, and now we're gonna give him some meds. We're gonna put him in a dark, quiet place, and we're gonna check on him in a couple hours. See if he needs more meds, more fluids. 
Tomorrow, if he's stable enough, we can do x-rays and evaluate him further, get him, maybe even have to hand feed or force feed him if he's not eating yet. And every time we look at him, we'll be reassessing his condition and, and determining um, the next stage in his rehabilitation. Let's go put him away. So I was just laying him down on the donut with his head elevated because I did just give him some fluid and I, I don't want him to aspirate or to choke on that. There you go, buddy. And we're not going to give him any type of light or anything like that because if I had a really bad headache, which I assume he does, I wouldn't want a bright light. Okay, so now we have another patient in our ICU. One, two, three.